Those stories coming your way now on KTN Prime. William Silla is our sign language interpreter. I'm Nancy Kachungira. Thank you for watching. Now, it's difficult to imagine living with your brain hanging from outside your head through a protrusion in the scalp. Well, this is the exact condition that an infant in Nyeri, baby Brian, has been living with for the last one year and four months. The baby has been living at the Madari Hospital in Nyeri since birth, since his 19-year-old mother ran away upon learning about his condition. KTN senior reporter Carol Nderi has that story. The cries of baby Brian welcome you to the baby unit of the Consolata Madari Hospital in Nyeri. Cries just as those of any other baby his age who is in need of attention. To his caregivers here, it is nothing short of a miracle that this baby has lived to see his first birthday. Initial diagnosis had given baby Brian just a few weeks to live, if not days, and this is why. Young Brian has a peculiar condition that has baffled medics. His brain is just outside his scalp and utmost care has to be given while handling it. We give the baby water and milk and then the baby is healthy, 13 kgs. His condition is known as encephaly. This is what led doctors to doubt if he would live at all, but he has surpassed expectations. He has been at this ward since he was born, one year, four months. One is heavy so you, and he can't support himself, so you have to be, I can say you have to be more careful with the baby, because for one, you have to be, to be aseptic. Some, uh, some tissue of the nose are missing, and therefore the, the skin and the bones that cover them uh, the, the head uh, also not there. Not only is his brain outside his head, but he has a severe congenital defect. Visiting teams of doctors, Adalia ruled out an operation to correct the defect due to his then tender age and the complexity of this kind of operation. Uh, he has a, what we would call a congenital abnormality, where he has a, a, a massive uh, cleft plus also an encephaly. An encephaly is where we don't have a covering of the brain tissue. We are in communication with Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, but uh, they said that they could not take the boy at that age. The strain of his care has been the hospitals. His 19-year-old mother allegedly abandoned her baby when she realized the extent of his deformity. So far, baby Brian has incurred a cost of 710,000 shillings for the one year and four months he has been here. He has to be turned in his crib every three hours by his caregivers. Deformities such as this occur during pregnancy for a number of reasons, as explained by the medics at Madari Hospital. One, I've mentioned for it, also too much alcohol when the mother is uh, expectant, or some other infections that the mother might get during pregnancy. He is scheduled to undergo an operation on 27th June at the same hospital. Their hope is that baby Brian will be able to live a normal life and attain milestones like any other child. On behalf of baby Brian, to make a very compassionate appeal to Kenyan medical professionals who are there, the micro surgeons and also uh, the neurosurgeons that they can support this boy whom we have supported this far but we cannot go beyond this because it is over and above our capacity as an institution. Carol Derry Katian, Nyeri. Such an amazing story. Baby Brian has certainly beaten the odds this far and we, of course, are praying with him for his surgery on Saturday. Now, the controversy surrounding the alleged irregular payments in the National Youth Service took an ugly turn after youth in Kibra attempted to burn down a toilet constructed by the NYS. However, in Kisumu, Waiguru received more support from NYS recruits who said that the NYS projects have changed their lives. Wilson Buru reports. It all started Monday after youth who claimed to be working for the NYS took to the streets to show their support for embattled devolution CS Anwai Guru over the corruption allegations that have rocked her ministry. But court leader Raila Odinga threw a spanner in the works late Monday afternoon claiming that the government was not being sincere. Did they have to wait for a whistleblower to discover that that was the case? So the, the more they speak, the more they confirm the need for 
forensic audit. Less than 24 hours later, this is what greeted the residents of Kibra, an arson attempt on a toilet in the area which was constructed by the NYS. It was reported that about 300 youth attempted to burn the ablution facility and the destruction of an adjacent clinic. The reason? NYS kwamba walijaribu kutaja jina Raila Molodinga na hasa ndio ule mtu tunamjua kama baba yetu hapa Kibera. Na isi vibaya kwa sababu gani? Hii si NYS peke yake, ni ya community in jumla. Kiona Raila ameongea. Amefanya uchunguzi ya kutosa kupata ya kwamba iko kitu imeenda kombo kwa serikali. Meanwhile in Kisumu another demonstration. Another group of youth claiming to be attached to the National Youth Service Islam Upgrading Project took to the streets protesting calls by court leaders for Waigoro to be suspended. We understand that there are, there are issues with the National Youth Service in Nairobi. We don't want to involve in politics. All we are asking the national government is to ensure that if there was any misappropriation of funds, uh, let the, uh, the legal procedure be taken. Shukrani kwake. Wakati hii kazi bado ilikuwa inakuja Jacob alikuwa wapi Sisi tuna thank to Anwai Guru pamoja na uru na kazi The accusations and counter accusations on the NYA saga do not seem to have any end in sight with political undertones and supremacy battles clouding the facts As that unfolds the criminal investigation department is expected to give a report on its findings soon Wilson Buru KTN Nairobi now, when you put the politics aside, you are left with the fact that the taxpayer almost was defrauded over over 800 million shillings. But before we get to this interview with some IT experts who will explain just how is that possible, especially considering that IFMIS was recently implemented, let's go to our big Q. Our question tonight is, do you support calls for Anwai Guru to quit over the NYS saga? Give us your thoughts on that and you can do so by sending an SMS to double two one double five. Once again, the question is, do you support calls for Anwai Guru to quit over the NYS saga? You can also tweet us at KTN News KE and at Kachungira. We'll take a look at some of your opinions later on. But let's get back to that discussion about this 826 million shilling fraud at NYS that was recently discovered. And in studio with me, I'm joined by by Kennedy Kachwana, and he is an information systems analyst, and Collins Odwo, who's the head of cybercrime at iLab Africa, Strathmore University. Thank you for coming, gentlemen. Thank you, Kennedy. Now, I, th I think if you get too complex, um, he's a technology writer, so he'll interpret what you're saying. But let's start with this, yes? Is this an internal job or an external job? Because there's still some debate about that. We're not sure whether this 826 million you know, and, and this fraud around it was something that was done in-house or is it possible that a hacker came from outside and penetrated the system? How is this possible? Uh, from my own point of view, this one looks more of a coalition, an internal thing that was just organized and this idea is something that has been going on for quite some time. Now, most of these cybersecurity attacks or attract uh, attacks that are propagated with or with hackers are done with help of an individual within the organization because we believe and I know that there are those external attacks that can be sent, yes, and there are malicious people out there. But looking into how this whole scenario has been playing or has been coming along, I can uh, for sure tell you that this is an internal thing and insider job. So what specific signposts are you noticing that say this, this is an insider's job? Look at how approval has, uh, had been done until it reached into that level that um, now it reached to the minister, the cabinet secretary for us to discover. Then there is the element of approvals that had to be done. If you look into if me system and how it works is that there is the segregation of data that have been segregated in different uh, areas ideally. So there was that element of ideally approvals. Now, what might have done, or what must, um, uh, uh, something that might have occurred ideally is that maybe this hacker or someone just inside the IT department might have had uh, installed uh, what we call Keylogger. Keylogger is ideally uh, a software that you can use to capture people's, someone's password Passwords. ideally. Mm. Uh, so he might have just installed it into the system with the help of some, some individuals to approve payments ideally. 
But either way, it needed some help from the inside. It needed some help from Kennedy, the inside. Kennedy, do you do you agree with this? Uh, yes, basically, because um, uh, some time back the government get got got it off from the public. So now you can only ac access it within the government network. So, so no one outside so the government uh, network can access if misses. Well, that that's still possible, but um, the way it's, it's now, I it's highly that um, the access is within the government. And of course, password, um, one of the things that uh, I realized when it was being launched is that it didn't have two-factor uh, two authentication, uh, meaning um, that you know the way you, when you go to ATM, you have the ATM card and mm -hmm. then you have the password. So you have two things to try to uh, authenticate who you are. Okay. So the system doesn't have something close to that. Um, so it's just password, you go in. Um, uh, and that, uh, that is shocking for a system that I assume we are paying a lot of money for. So is this um, a, a major flaw? in the system? Yeah, for that big system, we expect that to be considered from the beginning. So when it was launched, it didn't have. Maybe now, I, I'm not sure, but um, due to the way that information is coming up, that somebody stole the password and able to do that, it means it still doesn't have that two-factor authentication. Um, but in in terms of uh, just how you know how much money passes through this system, do you feel that there are enough levels of security from what you know? I'll start with you. I, yes, um, actually, when you look at that system, so many people um, it goes through many steps, and so many people have to approve it. So for it to go that far. I guess somebody had to compromise a number of people to go that far. Um, but also this, that possibility that uh, the, master, uh, the master login uh, details was the one being used, meaning that um, somebody who has um, uh, bigger access to the system, probably so that he is able to you know, approve different level. Um, Highly unlikely, but that one could be also a factor. All right, Collins, I think you, you want to say something about yes, that. I want to say something. The system might be vulnerable, but people who operate the system mm. are slightly more vulnerable than that. You might have a secure system, but if your people are not well trained, if they don't have the right skills, and if you can perform, for example, a social engineering attack on them, you can easily get access into the system. So this is one of the things that might have happened, ideally, a social engineering attack where... Uh, from a, from a hacker's point of view, I'd send you an email that has a malicious link. And when you open that email, then I can steal your password and all that. So it all rolls down into awareness and training and the people who operate IFMIS. And then apart from that, the system might be vulnerable if it is not well patched. I mean, if it is not upgraded, that means that uh, the people who are operating this uh, system, uh, they might forget simple things. So mm -hmm. what the government needs to do is to perform a penetration testing in all the government systems, because trust me, most of them are vulnerable. Mm, okay, well, clearly a lot of um, things that need to be looked at. But let's talk about, and you mentioned to me that you're an ethical hacker. Yes. Emphasis on ethical, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> so in terms of finding out what went wrong or who was compromised, is that possible and how can it be done? Can we catch where this 826 million went wrong? It is very, very possible. What we need to do is just to do a computer investigation, ideally. And uh, we need to do what is referred to as a chain of custody, whereby we'll be able to link uh, the individual who... Uh, who it's, it's actually possible to get the individual the IP address that was used. I believe that... Uh, I, I know that the government right now is working with the cybercrime unit to, to, to find the perpetrators. So it is very, very possible. Okay. Right. And do you agree as, as yeah, well? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's possible. There sometimes it's, it's the wheel, which probably not there, but if they want to know who... So you're saying that the absolutely it is very, very possible to find out exactly yeah. uh, who compromised the system? Because the, system, the way that system is, even when you're doing it, uh, there are so many people who can see what others are doing right. uh, within the chain of command. So um, basically when they go backward and try to see this um, this this transaction was initiated from which point and, and that, that's really possible so the question is when you say your password was st stolen so now mm. that's now where the you know yes because actually uh, the new senior deputy director that's uh, general gedo harake did say that his if miss password was stolen yes. what happens in such a situation can you prove that his password was stolen how, how does that work it is possible to prove that his password was stolen, but then now it, when you get into the court, it will be very difficult in a way. But uh, 
even if the IP address, for example, that was used it was forged or spoofed ideally, it is still possible to do that. Now, what they need to, to do is they need to seek experts and people who have the right skills ideally to to, to help them out find out these uh, perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And, and, and also this also this thing that um, you know the most popularly used password is the word password <laughs> and then the next one is one two three four five six um that's actually worldwide and we, um, well I, I would hope that government <laughs> officials are not using, are not those using that passwords. but but but, uh, but but you see the same case um I, I remember once the police website was hacked sometime back and the yes. password was password the password was password yes oh dear. But anyone can even guess without even having any hacking knowledge oh dear so <laughs> there are so many factors which can come to play because sometimes also you can find the government official who probably is not careful with the password. Maybe you just write it somewhere. Right. You know, not so in to forget. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of IFMIS, this has been controversial. I mean, this is something that was supposed to promote a lot of transparency and change basically the way government procurement especially works. But when you look at the system as a whole, is this value for taxpayers' money or is this a case of a lot of theory, but in practice things fall apart? No, it's value. Uh, the system itself is good. If you look at it in, um, entirely, it's very good. Um, um, the question is, um, we have the culture. So sometimes, you know, mm. if people want to go around the system, they will find they, a way. They find a way. Right. Um, so, but, but we have the, uh, if we can develop the culture um, to be, you know, transparency start with individual, mm. not the system. Because, mm. you know, system <laughs> is done by individuals. Yes. So the yeah. system is only as good as, as the people, good as who, the people use who use it. Right. Yeah. So, so th that's the point. Um, but uh, in terms of the system, when we leave the human point uh, out of it, it's good. Okay. Your, f your final thoughts on this, Collins? The government is trying and uh, we are moving towards the right direction. But as we are moving towards digital, we need to put in mind that security is core. Without security, all just be a waste of taxpayers' money. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us thank with you. those insights, gentlemen. And thank you also for keeping it uh, <laughs> uh, simple enough for us to understand. Thank and you. essentially, you're saying that as long as the will is there, we can actually get to the bottom yes. of, of, this, of this case. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that discussion. Thank you're watching KTN Prime. Now, as we move on, the county government of Nairobi has promised to support traders and residents who lost their property in the dawn fire at the popular Gikomba market. Those who witnessed the fire incident have characterized it as the worst in Gikomba market yet. KTN's Ian Wafula tells us more. By the time it was dawn, the billowing smoke had sent a message to all corners of the capital. Hundreds of photos captured the morning signal that all was not well. Gikomba was burning once again. <laughs> But it was only by following the smoke to its source that one would know the intensity of the destruction. The faces of the residents and business operators told the stories of loss, hopelessness and a bleak future. Witnesses say the fire began at around 3 a.m. at one of the stalls before it spread to the rest of this section of the market. Uh -huh. And while the entrepreneurs are counting their losses, others living by the markets were coming to terms with being homeless. For 19 years now. When the firefighters got to the scene, the damage was already done. Theirs was a tough time as they tried to contain the fire. I am a firefighter. Authorities brush aside speculation about arson. A certain stall whereby our officers received information that that fire started from that stall. We are withholding that information as at now. That one will form a basis of investigation. I think it is uh, 
uh, not purely accidental that we have too many uh, fires here. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, there are people responsible for them and we must uh, find out who they are and bring them to book. Deputy President William Ruto and Governor Dr. Evan Skidero toured the market and promised government support for traders and residents who lost the property. Kuanzia kesho baada ya sisi kukabiliana na moto hii vijana wa NYS na vijana wa Kikomba hapa wengine washirikiane tutapanga mpango washirikiane waweze kusafisha sehemu hii yote na wao ndio tutakao watumia kujenga vibanda mpya hapa katika Kikomba We are going to get a lasting solution we are going to bring tutajenga permanent structures ili tumalize maneno ya moto Today's fire incident, which has been described by residents and business operators here as the worst ever witnessed in the history of Gikomba market, was inevitable according to them. This is because they say the government has failed to listen to some of their concerns, which include poor lighting, congestion and insecurity within this general area. And they say that should these issues not be addressed, cases like these will continue and millions will also be lost. Ian Wafula, KTN Nairobi. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with KTN Prime. Health Cabinet Secretary James Masharia has defended the controversial 41.5 billion shilling medical equipment project, saying that it was driven by public demand. Masharia denies that the initiative was prompted by governors. The project has sparked controversy with the Council of Governors accusing the Ministry of insincerity and withholding critical information about the contract. Patrick Amimo has more. And level five in every country. A joint Senate Committee on Finance, Commerce and Budget is now investigating the controversial medical equipment project that is targeting level five hospitals in each of the 47 counties and level four hospitals in every sub-county. National referral hospitals will also benefit from the project. The project will cost 432.4 million US dollars. We require 41 billion shillings, 465 million, 808,000. At today's exchange rates. The popular assumption has been that the medical equipment was leased by the national government, but the cabinet secretary dismissed that notion, saying a team of consultants and procurement experts agreed on a managed equipment services model in order to allow hospitals focus on the core mandate of providing clinical services. That arrangement appeared confusing to senators, and even the health officials could not explain it satisfactorily. This is not a purchase, it's not a loan, it's not a lease. Because there have been a sort of uh, misconception that we are actually leasing this equipment. We are not. So the question is, what is it? It has a clause here. That simply means that you have transferred an obligation to counties on this equipment, which would not otherwise be if it was a lease. We are really concerned that under this arrangement you are going into, which is not a lease, it is something else, I still don't understand exactly what it is. They are calling it managed equipment service. So why are you unable to use that term? Our view is that it is, it is lease financing, and that is what um, the literature suggests to us when we evaluated it. I'm sure somebody signed a contract somewhere. Yes. What does that contract say? Is it a lease finance or does it have some other terminology? Um, have you ever seen it? No, I haven't seen the document yet. So what are you speaking from? Uh, you are speaking from what I, point I of speak, the information? I am speaking, I am speaking from uh, the uh, original documents, the MOUs that were signed. Forget about the MOU. Have you seen any documents signed between the manufacturers and the government of the Republic no, of Kenya? No, Chair. So then your information is just a rumor. Kakamega Senator Boni Halwale argued the project was overpriced and a ripoff. Halwale says an expert analysis of the project shows an outright purchase of equipment would have saved each county 585 million shillings. If they are allowed to purchase outright and still hire that service contract, they'll need only 223 million in seven years. Tell us. Who is pocketing the 585 million shillings, 808 minus 223? That is the scandal. If we are to buy the equipment, how much would it cost us? There is a document which was done by independent consultants. So those figures, I would quite commit to this committee that they are not credible.
Despite the confusion surrounding the managed equipment service arrangement model, the Capital Secretary for Health insists that the procurement process was done above board. Party Kamimo, KTN, Nairobi. Waiguru under fire, that's our hashtag tonight. And the question we're asking you is whether you support calls for Anne Waiguru to quit over this NYS saga. Thank you for sharing your opinions. And remember, you can continue to do so. Send us a tweet at KTN News KE. My, ha my handle is at Kachungira. Or you can send an SMS to 22155. Let's take a quick look at what you're saying. One here from Kobicom. You say, no, she shouldn't quit because the positive side can even be felt by the blind so in strong support there Charlo McAllo you say she should step aside to allow for investigations and another one here this one comes from Wanjiku Mugane you say no she is working hard the problem is that we oppose positive developments and another one here coming in from Finton Dinya Yours is actually a condemnation of the events that took place in Kibra. You say it is reckless to destroy facilities that you are badly in need of. Well, Guru Under Fire is our hashtag. This is KTN Prime. We'll be right back after this break. And a warm welcome on KTN Business. My name is Abi Agina. We start off from the banks. They have earned an unsavory reputation over the years from the perception that they make a lot of profit by fleecing both depositors and borrowers. But now it seems it would be that MPs are looking to make a third attempt to rein in the banking sector. Adelaide Changole reports. The year is 2001, and the member of parliament for GEM constituency, Joe Donde, has just published a private member's bill that seeks to tame the real interest rate spread in Kenya, which at the time is among the highest in the world. The MP sought to cap interest rates chargeable on loans to a maximum of 4% of the prevailing 91-day treasury bill rates, while the deposit rate was to be no less than 4 percentage points below the T-bill rate. As was to be expected, the bill received widespread opposition from the banks and the donor community. Despite sailing through Parliament, the bill never saw the light of day. In 2012, GEM MP Jacob Mediwo sought to amend the finance bill to cap lending rates at 4 percentage points over the central bank rate and deposit rates at 70% of the benchmark CBR. But just like the previous bill, this too flopped. Despite this, banks remained in the spotlight with regulators worried about the high spread between what the banks pay depositors and their lending rates. Spreads of this magnitude generally happen uh, after you have had a uh, financial a banking crisis. In a move to deal with this, the central bank unveiled the Kenya Bank's reference rate last year. KBRR is based on an average of the CBR rate and the 91-day T-bill yield over a six-month period. Banks are required to price all loans using KBRR as their base rate and K to represent the risk premium unique to every borrower. But it would seem that legislators are not satisfied with this. The MPs have now launched a brand new effort to control interest rates. Waluke wants to amend Section 36 of the CBK Act to compel banks and microfinance lenders to cap borrowing rates at 5 percentage points above the central bank lending rate. But the prospective governor and deputy governor of the central bank have warned against the move. To fight it directly against the banks is not really going to be a very um, sustainable way. We can win for a while, but we will not be sustainable. They say the answer lies not in capping interest rates, but rather in reducing the factors that increase risk and increasing competition in the banking sector. The draft bill will be scrutinized by the Finance, Planning and Trade Committee, chaired by Aina Moe MP Benjamin Langat, before it's published and formally introduced in the House. Adelaide Chongole, KTN Business. Many thanks, Adelaide. And still in the banking sector, the National Bank Board has defended the management team over mismanagement accusations. This follows media reports on high staff turnover and irregular dealings in the wake of an ongoing restructuring program. Charles Gitonga reports on this story. The restructuring program at National Bank is first turning into one riddled with more questions than answers. The bank is having to fight off a sting of negative sentiments with fresh twists being high-level plundering at the bank. The cost-cutting strategy, high employee turnover and suspicious transactions are among the string of queries raising eyebrows as to whether the lender is really on the much-hyped transformational path. In the greater shape of it, we're still pursuing that seven-pillar strategy, 50 projects that we're doing, which is 
reducing the cost, strengthening the uh, balance sheet uh, management, strengthening the, co the control environment. A letter dated May 14, 2015 to the bank's chief executive from Treasury Principal Secretary Dr. Kamau Thuge has in recent past taken the center stage of the controversy with reports that it called for an investigation into the bank's activities and accounts held by individuals in the bank. But according to Treasury and National Bank Management, that was not the case. The letter did not talk of anything about investigation. It just referred to some due diligence being carried out in preparation for the privatization. Uh, the letter basically was telling us that they have stopped the privatization process and that they are thinking about merging with other banks and they want management to help their consultant in assisting them in coming up with scenarios. The bank has however stated there hasn't been much progress towards establishing the risk involved in disposal of preferential shares held by NSSF and Treasury as ordered by the letter. The bank now says its restructuring process is well on course towards cutting costs, diversifying revenue streams, and pushing it to a top-tier lender in three years. Alarm bells started ringing at the bank last year with high staff turnover on the back of the restructuring process. Since then, the bank has also seen more than 15 top managers leave in the past eight months over what is believed to be differences with the CEO. While responding to the restructuring process, the bank did not make any mention of the allegations around asset stripping and irregular transactions. Charles Gitonga, KTN Business. Yes, of course, that's a story that has been eliciting quite a lot of reactions online as well. Moving on, Francis Wangusi has been reappointed to serve for a four-year term as the Director General of the Communications Authority. According to the Board of Directors, Wangusi emerged the best of the six shortlisted candidates to the position. Wangusi's current three-year term expands on August 22nd. Observers reckon that the move to retain Wangusi was widely anticipated as the Board was keen on ensuring continuity at the government body. Wangusi will be tasked with overseeing the transition to digital broadcasting while also ensuring telecommunications farms follow the quality of service regulations. Well, and that's all the time we had for on KTN Business. And before I go, we just want to salute the Director General for being appointed for another term. Well, my name is Abigina. Let's meet tomorrow to discuss matters business. Coming up next is the sports. And the Kenya National 15s rugby team Simba will play Tunisia in the uh, second round match of the Africa Rugby Division 1A Championships this Sunday in Nairobi. The match will be played at the RFUA grounds. It will be a match between two teams who lost their first round matches. Kenya lost 20-28 to Zimbabwe while Tunisia uh, had lost to Namibia. Namibia will be taking part in the Rugby World Cup which is coming up in about 82 days from today. The winner of Sunday's match will secure points that will allow them to enjoy elite status in the new season besides placing themselves in a good position to win the group's title. Stati stat statistically, Tunisia enjoys a better head-to-head -head over Kenya using the seven times the two sides have met. And to some football news now, local English Premier League side Arsenal fans had got, got an opportunity to take pictures with the FA Cup trophy that the side won a couple of weeks ago. The trophy was brought into the country courtesy of a partnership uh, with, the, with the Imperial Bank. Arsenal fans turned in their numbers to take selfies and kiss the two-eared trophy. Arsenal FC clinched the trophy following its victory in the FA Cup final at Wembley. Argentine football legend and World Cup winner Diego Maradona has announced he will vie for the FIFA presidency to replace Sepp Blatter, who steps out of office at the end of the year. Maradona revealed his intentions to Uruguayan a journalist and author Victor Hugo Morales when he called the former coach of the Argentina team 
to check on the condition of his sick father on Sunday. The news comes a month after Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro suggested that the former Argentine captain runs for the footballing association's top uh, post. Maradona has been a long-time critic of Sepp Blatter and was vocal in calling for the Swiss to step down amid the FIFA corruption scandal investigations. KTN Weather, in association with Mortine Du. Mama has Mortin Doom, which makes mosquitoes go away and not come back the whole night. So you get a peaceful night's sleep all night long. Mortin Doom. A peaceful night is a Mortin Doom night. Well, as we wrap up this edition of KTN Prime, let's take you back to our big queue, which was whether you support calls for Ann Guru to quit over the NYS saga. Thank you very much for sharing your feedback with us. Unfortunately, we don't have a poll result, but we do have quite a number of opinions. One here from Kimaru J, and you say, if stepping aside was the ultimate solution, we would now be corruption-free Kenya. Another one here from at Kihima. You say you can't use the small deeds to sugarcoat theft. Why build me a toilet and take away my 826 million? All right. Well, thank you for sharing your opinion. Let's take a look at some of your SMSs here as well. This one is a no. You say, I thank Waiguru. She's done a very good job in Kibera. Please let us not focus on the negative side, but try as much as possible to see the good work. Kudos, Madam Waiguru. Don't give up. There's a yes here. And this is from Jonah in Nairobi. You say, no successful investigations cannot be done when Waiguru is there. She needs to step aside. And another no here. The CS is doing a fantastic job and she should stay put. It's apparent the opposition will go to any length to look for scandals. And that's from Peter. Well, thank you for sharing your opinions this evening and for being a part of the program. William Silla was our sign, la our sign language interpreter. And I'm Nancy Kachingira. It was a pleasure having you with us. We look forward to having you again tomorrow on KTN Prime. For now, though, it's good night from the Standard News Centre.